fees, estimating thermodynamic parameters from experimental measurements. And he's also been involved in the development of several sampling and uh, estimation based methods using non equilibrium statistical mechanics. Um, so, without further ado, we'll turn it over to David then. Thanks. Thanks, Jonah. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's been interesting having uh, virtual conferences the last year. Um, so, anyways, um, today I wanted to talk about doing large scale free energy calculations with implicit ligand theory. And by large scale, I just mean larger scale than is possible with um, standard approaches or other approaches to free energy calculations. Let's see. Okay, so I want to start by showing you a movie of the key component of the calculations that we're doing. And this is called the binding of mean force calculation. It's there's a lot of similarities with what we're doing with with what a lot of people are doing with alchemical free energy calculations. Uh, we're using Hamiltonian replica exchange. We're using uh, a lot of the similar algorithms. Uh, the, the main difference here, as you probably notice, is that the receptor is completely rigid. And you might think for a moment, like, oh, why would you possibly do that? What's the point of doing that? Because really, in reality, it's moving. The receptor is moving. And you might also think, oh, this is probably a lot faster than a regular free energy calculation. And that would be also true. Um, in that not only do you have lots of fewer lots fewer degrees of freedom that you have to sample, but it also means that there's some shortcuts that can be done to represent the interactions between the receptor and the ligand. Um, basically, the effect of the receptor can be represented on point as points on a grid as creating a potential that has a very similar shape as the actual positions of those atoms. And that saves a lot of pairwise computation. And basically also means you can do a really large a simulation with a really large receptor and take about the same time as a small receptor. I'm also doing a couple of things I wouldn't do with an alchemical calculation, which is ramping up the temperature really high beyond what the protein would unfold. And oh, alpha is a coupling parameter. At zero, it's basically in a sphere. It's constrained in a sphere. At, a, at one, it's basically in the binding site, fully coupled with the receptor. And in this particular case, it does look like it follows into the crystallographic pose, which is in purple. OK, but that still doesn't answer the question, what was the point of doing this calculation where everything's rigid? Well. It turns out that you can take the average of this quantity, the binding potential mean force. You can take an average across um, multiple receptor conformations, and that gives you a binding free energy. And I showed this in a 2012 paper. Are people having trouble hearing me? I hope not. Um, I can hear you OK. OK. Um, so this is theoretically rigorous, and um, it uses multiple rigid receptor restructures, which gives you gives advantages. You can recycle these. So a lot of times we heard, or sometimes we heard this morning, that one of the major problems with absolute binary free energy calculations or binary free energy calculations in general is sampling the receptor. Basically, to get an accurate free energy calculation, you need to get the receptor sampling configurations that are important in every single thermodynamic state along the alchemical pathway. But if you use this approach, you only have to sample the receptor once. You don't have to do it for every single ligand. Um, and, and I mentioned that you could have a grid-based receptor ligand interaction energy. And once you have sampled the receptor and you, you calculate the grid, it doesn't, the size of the receptor doesn't affect the speed of the calculation. Uh, you can also say that docking is an approximation to the binding free energy and by these uh, statistical mechanical or skipping some averages and replacing them with minima. So to actually do a binding free energy calculation based on this theory, there's a couple steps to that. One is to sample configurations of the receptor. 
And I mentioned that this is only needs to be done once. It doesn't have to be reproduced for every single ligand. And if you have a large conformational change, then yeah, yeah, this could be helpful that you only have to do it once. And then you can estimate the binding potential mean force for each ligand to each configuration of the receptor. And then you take a weighted average based on the weight of each receptor snapshot as W, and that can give you a binding free energy. And this delta G epsilon term is a external uh, confinement factor that's a constant. So there are many ways to calculate binary free energies, um, some of which we've heard about today. And I would say that this approach to doing free energy calculations could fall in between the whole gamut of methods in terms of lot, computational expense and accuracy, where I expect it to be more accurate than docking, less accurate than explicit solvent alchemical pathway calculations. A nice thing about this approach is that you can tune the accuracy knob, you can increase the accuracy of the calculation in a principled manner, basically by increasing the number of snapshots that you compute the binding potential mean force for. Uh, we apply this, well, in the original paper, I applied it to a host guest system. Uh, more recently, my group applied this to T4 license sime L99A and 141 ligands. 141 ligands was just what we saw experimental data for. There was not a limitation in the compute time. Um, and basically we took the receptor snapshots from, we took two approaches to doing the uh, receptor snapshots. One was to do a flexible receptor alchemical calculation using the Yank package from the Codera group. We also used uh, Markov state models. The first one we published and the second one, we still haven't gotten into, around to publishing. Most of this was done by my former PhD student, Bing Zhe, who was at this conference before. Um, and basically, we can sample the energy landscape of, or look at the energy landscape of the protein, the APO protein, um, by M-bar reweighting of the Yank simulations. And then we can draw from this energy landscape configurations that we um, get binding potential mean force for. And using this approach, we get a close reproduction of the flexible receptor results. We also found that we need to use snapshots from multiple alchemical simulations. It wasn't good enough just to do uh, a simulation with phenol binding to T4 lysozyme. We take those snapshots, we, we get a pretty bad correlation with the yank and with, with respect to other oh, root mean square error is high. Or we wouldn't know a priori which are the best which are the best ligands to do a simulation with. But you can take snapshots from most of the, multiple simulations, multiple Yank simulations that are based on alchemical uh, pathways, and if we pick out 576. We get a very good correlation and also small root mean square error, and the performance is not much deteriorated if we only consider. Um, ligands which are known to be active against T4 lysozyme, meaning changing the melting temperature. I, we also demonstrated that you can tune the knob of accuracy by increasing the number of snapshots. And we, you can select a subset of snapshots from the original uh, 500 something odd snapshots in multiple ways. Um, in this plot, we show the effects of picking them either randomly, that's red. So you can see that there's a slow but steady increase in the accuracy as you increase the snapshots or the subset of snapshots that are used and the compute, binding potential mean force is computed using. Um, but it's not very fast compared to the other approaches. The other approach, there's two uh, other approaches that are just shown here. One is to say, okay, let's pick the one that has the lowest binding potential mean force. And we're gonna use that snapshot first. We're gonna use the next snapshot beyond that and then rank them in order of binding potential mean force. This is sort of like a limit because there's no real reason to only use a subset of snapshots if you already calculated the binding potential mean force for all the snapshots. 
So it's really just to demonstrate how good you can do by using this ordering. And that's in blue. And you can see that, okay, you get much faster convergence, much faster um, reaching the correlation and the RMSC of the full set of snapshots if you use the lowest binding potential mean force. That's not very practical though. What we, but another approach you can do is you can do a docking. So docking can, you know, take, it only takes, it can only it can take a few seconds, it can take a few minutes, but it's gonna be much faster than even the calculation I showed you, which can take about a day on a single CPU. And yeah, using docking, we can get a much faster increasing accuracy with number of receptor snapshots. We also wanted to try Markov state models because there's a lot of people who are using Markov state models. And I guess there's a, there has been a companion workshop to this workshop with Markov state models. And people have been using it to study protein folding and also all sorts of processes, uh, biomolecular processes. And it's often without any ligand or anything like that. So it's often a APO simulation. And yeah, people use these many short trajectories, piece it together. So there's a ton of sampling. There's a lot of data sets out there. Uh, for example, there were Markov, Holding at Home made Markov state models for all these COVID-19 targets. Could be useful. Uh, but anyways, we tried T4 lifetime because that's the hydrogen atom of the free energy field. And we just did four simulations from four different crystal structures that have different conformations. And then we did clustering of Tika and we can get a, a wet energy lit surface. This is all MSM stuff that is pretty established relatively, but I just wanted to show it to you briefly. And then we said, okay, how are we going to pick these snapshots to do the binding potential mean force and then to calculate binding free energies? So the first thing we said is, okay, we have all these Markov state model centers. And then we can, we can dock to them and we can calculate the binding potential mean force. These all are very high. We, we scratched our heads for a while. We were like, we actually need, none of them are negative. That's, that's a bad sign. And you need things that are lower than the actual free energy to estimate the free energy. That's true for any exponential average. So the next question is, why are they so high? Then we looked at it, the structures and it looks like in a lot of cases, the binding pocket of T4 lysozyme is collapsed in the implicit solvent. So we tried a couple of number of different approaches. We said, okay, let's just use more and more snapshots, like build a more complex Markov state model didn't help uh, so got a suggestion like okay, what if you do a minimization of the receptor by itself before you dock into it with or calculate the binding pmf or what if you get a complex you dock it and then you uh, minimize then and then you use that structure for the binding pmf we we're just trying to get something that works or makes sense and it didn't work either um, but my student had the bright idea which was to pick 10 snapshots with the largest pocket volume. And we got good correlations with the Yank experiment, LG doc, um, with the, uh, from the previous calculation. But these 10 largest pocket volume, well, that's not really a general strategy that will necessarily work or be representative. So we wanted to try other ways to pick out snapshots. And we I wrote a paper, we, wrote, we had written a paper um, back in 2018 about how to pick out receptor snapshots. And we picked out this, we were able to uh, specify that this problem of picking receptor snapshots is very much like what is known as ensemble docking um, using reduced ensemble. So the idea in ensemble docking is that people do a simulation of the system and then they dock two snapshots from it. But there's so many snapshots and they're, a lot of the docking scores could be very similar. So we wanna pick a diverse set. 
or somehow reduce the size of the full ensemble to some selected ensemble. You know, that's a very common problem in the docking field. And so that we recognize that uh, this is an example of something known in statistics as stratified sampling. And the way that people do assess the quality of stratified sampling is by the efficiency of stratification, which is basically the ratio of the estimated meter variance between the stratified and simple random sampling. So if you didn't have any stratification prior to picking out snapshots. OK, what is stratification? Stratification is like grouping the samples into subsets and saying that there's similarities, similarities of the properties within the subset. And that then we can say weight the weight an estimate from each subset by the size of that subset. And that's essentially what's done in ensemble docking. And it's better to have a lower eta value. So in this paper, we tried a bunch of methods to do. Um, reduce ensemble reduction. And I won't go into tons of detail about each method, and I'm not going to say that it's an exhaustive approach, but it's certainly what I suggest is that it's a benchmark or a way to categorize or determine whether one method is better than another. Now, what, what we ultimately recommended in the paper was to compute an occupancy fingerprint, basically one if there's an atom nearby a space in a grid in zero otherwise. And then you can, these are, you could be posed as binary vectors and you can compare binary vectors using a distance metric called the Jacquard distance. So you can read this paper for more details about that. And when we use this clustering approach uh, from 20,000 snapshots, we can pick out 200 representative snapshots. And what you see in the, x-axis on the right is the pocket volume, and the y-axis is the binary potential mean force. And the binary potential mean force, as you can see when the pocket volume is smaller than, I think it's 50 ang cubic angstroms, basically everything is high. It just doesn't fit in there, which makes sense. And probably not even worth doing a calculation for such small pockets, because you can just say that um, the probability is infinitesimally small. Um, but we can't just pick out the 10 highest. If you just picked out the highest pocket volume snapshots, you'd be missing a lot of snapshots that have good binding affinity for the ligand, but don't have much volume. Anything above 50, essentially. Anything between 50 and 150. And you can see that some of the lowest binding PMFs are for snapshots with a pocket volume of about 100. So anyways, this strategy worked. We can pick a uh, 1,000 snapshots to get this good correlation between the previous Yank results and the new free energy calculation with algae doc using the Markov state model to generate receptor snapshots. So those are. Um, ways that we've calculated, or two ways that we've calculated, uh, or dr drawn receptor snapshots. I want to go into another aspect of what we're trying to do in developing the, this approach, which is to use the fast Fourier transform to calculate the binding potential mean force. Uh, this is a common approach in docking, especially docking for proteins and proteins to, with one another, and also docking uh, fragments to proteins to look for hot spots or where a fragment may bind to the protein. And the idea is generally to, or in general, it's to represent each molecule, both the protein or both the receptor and ligand as a three-dimensional grid. And there's a correlation function between the grids that gives you a sense of shape complementarity. At least in the original formulation, it was all about shape complementarity. So basically, in panel A, you basically have no correlations. Um, so no score. In panel C, there's some clash. But B and D are pretty good because the surfaces overlap a bit, but not 
really the center, so you don't get that steric clash. And they're still doing um, protein docking this sort of way, although they use more advanced force fields now. Um, what we did was we said you can actually not, not only get, so, okay, I have to give you a little brief more explanation. You get this correlation function comes from, or if you do a Fourier transform, you will get this, the value of this correlation function for many different translations of the grids relative to one another. And then, um, and usually the way that this is treated is just like docking. We find the lowest score or the highest shape complementarity. Uh, what we showed in a paper in J Journal of Computational Chemistry is that you can take an exponential average of these interactions energies and get a binding potential mean force. And from multiple binding potential mean force, you can get a binding free energy. And yeah, we can do a, you can calculate an inter interaction energy between a ligand of T4 lysozyme and the, the protein. And you can calculate at many different points. This is just coloring, colored by the interaction energy. In many cases, well, this is a, this shape envelope in the maroon color um, basically means that there's no, there's a steric clash. So we're not going to include those or not consider those. But you do see a lot of, positions where there's a negative interaction energy corresponding to the attraction between the systems. And using this approach, we can repro reasonably reproduce what we see in Yank on the left-hand side. In the right-hand panel, you see the correlation with uh, AlgaDoc. There's a lot more systems with AlgaDoc because we did the 141 systems. So that was helpful and we're building on this to, or my current students building this on, onto this for protein-protein interactions. Um, you can also, we also showed that you can, you know, so far I've been talking about absolute binding free energy calculations, but you can also get a relative binding free energy using the same binding potential mean force. You just have to weight the snapshots differently. Instead of using the weight from the APO ensemble, you use the weight from a hollow ensemble for a specific ligand. And um, yeah, I mean, there's just different ways to use the same data to get a different or to estimate this free energy difference. And I think this is quite helpful or could be quite helpful if many hollow ensembles are similar to one another, but not similar to an APO ensemble. Uh, final thing I want to mention before concluding or before addressing questions is a way that we've found to categorize the, except the activity of nuclear receptor ligands. So estrogen receptor is an important hormone receptor and it's known to be activated by many chemicals and there's a lot of possible toxicities associated with um, by being an agonist or antagonist of estrogen receptor. It's commonly thought that there are two conformations that are important for estrogen receptor. And actually, a lot of nuclear hormone receptors have pretty much the same structure. And they primarily differ in the position of helix, this helix that is colored red on the panel B and C. And this helix that is colored red in all the active structures, it seems to have this orientation and has a different orientation in many other crystal structures. This could be called the inactive, but there's also been hypotheses that really this second helix is very flexible when the, there's no transduction of signal. The common thought has been that the reason that a molecule is an agonist or an antagonist is because if it's an antagonist, it's just too bulky, it won't fit into the site. Uh, to the binding site to be an active structure of the active structure. Well, we, we want to look into this a little bit more quantitative. There is a lot of data out there about ligands. Like I think at the time we started doing this, there were about a hundred different ligands that were known to be agonists or antagonists. And we, we basically calculated, we, we did a binding potential mean force calculation. We can draw out the mean 
interaction energy, that's a y-axis. And you can also look at the binding potential mean force. You can see that the antagonists, which you wouldn't think bind to the active structure, um, actually have a very low mean interaction energy, actually lower than the agonist. So that sort of throws things out the window in that line of thought. Another th but then you also see on the x-axis of this two-dimensional histogram that the antagonists have a much higher binding potential mean force than the agonists. So that suggests that basically what's happening is the antagonists don't activate the protein because they lose so much entropy when they bind. Now you can see that sort of in these two examples on the bottom, where if you have a agonist that's bound, its number of configurations is not vastly different from the number of configurations that are available in the for the unbound agonist, but there's a lot of entropy that's lost. If you look at the ensemble of, of configurations that are drawn from the unbound ensemble, it's much different from the bound ensemble for the antagonist. So this could be, uh, I mean, we just have a small amount of data and maybe we look at a more, couple more systems, but it, it's pretty interesting if we can categorize uh, activity using this kind of binding free energy calculation. Um, all right, so that's all I have. Uh, and I'll address any questions that may be raised. Great, thanks so much. We'll do a clap on behalf of the audience. <laughs> um, thanks, Jonah. Yeah, yeah. Great talk. Thanks, David. Uh, there's no uh, questions yet, so please type in your questions to be answered. Um, I'll start off with a quick one. Um, you know, I really like this last slide. I was wondering, is there a way to uh, quantify, you know, this configurational entropy between the bound and unbound states? I guess it'd just be the difference between the binding PMF and the mean interaction energy. Okay. As a way to quantify the loss of entropy, yeah. Right. Okay, perfect, thanks. Uh, Amelia had a question on the chat for panelists. Oh, it is. Thanks. I didn't see that. Uh, um, the source of the snap. Can you say a few more yeah. words on the source of the snapshots? For example, APO versus hollow and in between, and how the statistical weights are determined. So there were two sources of snapshots that we used. One was the alchemical calculation using Yank. Um, and then we determined the weight in the APO ensemble using MBAR. Or we can determine the weight in the hollow ensemble using MBAR as well. That's what we did in a few of the papers. Um, so they are, all the snapshots themselves are from APO and hollow and between, but the weights are either APO or hollow. And for the Markov state model simulations, those are purely APO. And that's the vast majority of Markov state model simulations will be purely APO. And we were able to extract out the configurations that are relevant for binding by using this clustering approach. Great. And in that case, the statistical weight of the configuration from the Markov state model comes from the free energy of the cluster of the microstate, or the probability of the microstate instead of MBAR. Great. Thanks, David. I'm sorry to interrupt your answer. Um, one last question uh, from the QA. It says Any structural rationale? Why higher ligand conf configurational entropy loss led to antagonism? Well, you can see in the slide that 
the binding potential need force, which specifies the affinity for the individual structure is higher, or it's not as strong of a binding to the active state. So presumably it will bind better to an un inactive state or one of many inactive states. So we tried the inactive crystal structure and there's not really much predictive power based on the affinity for the inactive crystal structure. But, um, but I think that's what's going on is basically it binds tighter to an inactive structure where the helix is placed in a different position and favors that and therefore there's not a signal transduction um, that is available to, or that is caused by the active structure. Great. Well, thank you, David. Again, round of applause. Um, there's one more uh, open question if you'd be willing to answer that uh, during your next talk, but we'll go ahead and transition to our next speaker.